for this lesson, the lesson today is going to be called Conspiracy Theories and the Bible. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 2. And so Psalm chapter 2, and I've got a lot of material. I'm going to try not to go too quickly over it, but I also am uh, very aware of time. So I'll try to do a good job of balancing between uh, flooding you with information <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, not, not going over time. So let's look at Psalm chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 just to kind of start as the springboard uh, to this uh, lesson. It says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Uh, let's pray uh, before we start this lesson. Dear Father, I pray that you would please bless this time at this Sunday school hour. I thank you so much for the privilege and the opportunity to be able to teach this lesson here at Hallelujah Side Baptist Church. And I pray that you would bless this church and that you would grow it, that you would bless uh, Brother and Sister Tooney while they are uh, out um, uh, doing uh, um, whatever, uh, whatever it is that they are doing. I, I don't remember what they said, if they did. And I pray that you would bless this lesson, bless all the uh, members here who have come to faithfully hear uh, the word of God. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So many people will scoff at conspiracy theorists uh, like they're a bunch of nut jobs. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, there are a bunch of nut jobs out there, and some of them do come up with crazy conspiracies uh, that are wrong. But are they all wrong? Are they always wrong? Let's look at uh, if um, – now, these, uh, these notes that I'm teaching from, they're actually available on my website. You can go to www.newtbc.com. That's N-E-W-T-B-C.com. And all I ask is that you register, and you can access these uh, lessons that I've got. They're full-color PDFs that I've put together. You can see uh, – you can access these lessons and download them for free. And everything that I do through New Testament Bible Course is all free, and uh, it will all be put up on the, on the website. And so I've got a little quote here. This is from David Rockefeller. If you know anything about the Rockefellers, you know, very rich family. Uh, they became rich through oil. Um, David Rockefeller, he died recently, just like this, this year or last year. I don't remember what. But he said, we are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis, and the nations will accept the new world order. What does the Bible say about conspiracies? Well, we just saw in our text that it talks about how the kings of the earth set themselves and they take counsel together. Interesting. Is there, is there ever a reason to fear that men who have wealth and power are working in cahoots to get more wealth and power? What do you think? Do you think people who have money are always trying to get more power and more money? It's, that seems to be a, a common uh, theme in history, if you will. And this can be answered by how you view man, because you can take a look at man as overall, an overall view of man, and you can say, well, men are basically good. At the core of things, men are basically good. And the thing why we have problems and why we have stuff is because their environment is bad. Because, you know, we've got people that say they're raised in an inner city, gang violence, terrible environment. And so because of this environment that they're in, that is why they turn out to be, um, you know, uh, go, end up in jail and end up in trouble and stuff like that. Or you can take a look at what the Bible says about man. And the Bible says that men are basically evil. And it says that, yes, environment may have a, have a play in certain things, but really we're born as sinners. And because, uh, because we're sinners, there's really nothing good that comes from us. Yet, God created the world originally perfect. And so once sin came into the world, that's where we get all of the bad from. And the reason why men can sometimes do such great noble things like all the hurricane relief and stuff like that. I just saw a news article recently. Some guy was saving food in his basement for 40 years. He was one of these, you know, end of the world survival guys. And all of a sudden he decided, you know what? Puerto Rico probably needs his food more than I do. And he sent like hundreds of barrels of food, 300 pound barrels of food to Puerto Rico. Sometimes people can do such great things because there's still that semblance of that of that created order that God originally created us with, unfortunately being tainted by sin. And so if you look at man as basically good, then it's difficult. You come to difficulties because what do you do with people who have, they were raised in a good environment. You know, if somebody was like David Rockefeller, he'd born with a silver spoon in his mouth, but now all of a sudden he's like turned into this really corrupt, evil guy. It doesn't make any sense. But if men are basically evil, then all that's going to happen is, is that power is going to corrupt. I don't remember who it was who said this, but somebody said, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. 
While I do not want to be a pessimist, the reality is no matter how much one may want to believe that man is basically good, the Bible teaches that man is naturally evil, selfish, and capable of terrible acts. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. And uh, with that said, people are still ca capable, again, of intense acts of kindness because Ecclesiastes 7.29 says, Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out evil inventions. So in other words, again, man started off good, but because of sin, now things have gone bad and they have the propensity to get out of control. Add a bunch of wealth, add a bunch of power into that, and you've got a, a bad recipe at center, plus money, plus power. You've got a propensity for some terrible things, terrible atrocities to occur. So what does all this have to do with the New World Order? What does it all matter? What, well, let's take a look at this. What, do, what does the Bible, you know, what does it have to do with the New World Order, the Bible, and conspiracy theories? Well, let's take a look at our text and, find, and figure out exactly what the Bible is talking about when it declares that the kings of the earth take counsel. Now that word... Council that could be considered, you know, they come together. What do they do? Council is they come together, they sit together, and they talk stuff out, right? They take counsel together, and that's what a council is. You know, we'll talk about a council. You have a council meeting. You got a bunch of people who sit around a table and they talk stuff out. Now, look at the word conspiracy. If we define the word conspiracy, we can get that definition out of the dictionary. I like the Webster's 1828 dictionary. It says, a combination of men for an evil purpose, an agreement between two or more persons. To commit some crime in concert, particularly a combination to commit treason or excite sedition or insurrection against the government of a state. It's a plot, it's a or you know, a conspiracy against the life of the king. You know, people came in conspiracy, they wanted to kill the king, something like that. So when the kings of the earth set themselves and they take counsel, who do they take counsel against when you look at Psalm 2 2? When we look at Psalm verse 2, it says the rulers take counsel together. The very next section, it says against the Lord. Against, well, that sounds almost exactly like the definition of a conspiracy. It's where men come together and they plot evil against some other higher power, which, of course, the Lord is the highest power. So with this in mind, let's find out what happens to the kings because we've only read the first three verses. Let's, let's go and let's take a look and let's see what happens when the men try to throw off the bands and throw off the cords. In other words, the governing, the restraints that God has laid on us to keep us from, from being so wicked. Verse 4 says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the, the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And so we can see the kings of the earth, they want to get rid of God. What do we see happening in America? We got, what, 1963, the Supreme Court ruled, no more prayer in the schools, no more Bible in the schools. We see today constantly happening. They're trying to get rid of crosses. They want crosses off of buildings. Just, just last week, uh, some county, I think it was in Pennsylvania, a judge ordered this county to remove the cross from the seal because they had a seal, you know, for whatever Pennsylvania county or something like that or city or whatever it was. And so we see that, that the country and people in the country and in the government are trying to remove God from, from everything, from, from common life, from daily life. And so what happens to a country that does that? What happens when kings do that? It says that God's going to destroy them. He's going to crush them. But blessed are those that put their trust in the Lord. And so who are these conspirators then? If there are conspiracy theories, we can see that the Bible says that evil men and rulers and kings do conspire against God. Who are they? What is going on? Who is responsible for this new world order? Who's meeting behind closed doors? Who are these wealthy and powerful men? Well, point number one, let's take a look at a very influential group in the world today, the Bilderbergers. The Bilderbergers. 
Now, uh, let me read this uh, section to you here. At a previous BG conference in Germany, Rockefeller spilled the beans in a tender bouquet to his co-conspirators in the media. This was a quote from, again, uh, David Rockefeller again. This is a different quote. He says, We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. He told the 1991 attendees, so this was many years ago now, it would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the bright lights of publicity during these years. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march toward a world government which will never again know war, but only peace and prosperity for the whole of humanity. And so what we've got to remember about the New World Order is that the people who are trying to pull it together think it's a great thing. They're trying to build a utopia. They're trying to build heaven on earth only without God. That's what they want. They want to get back to the Garden of Eden the way it was before Adam sinned in the garden. And they want the Garden of Eden, but they don't want God. That's what they want. And so uh, that's, that's what they're trying to do. And so when they speak of there'll be no more war, there'll be peace, there'll be prosperity. Yeah, but how do they plan on getting there? If, uh, if you've had a chance to see some of my previous uh, lessons, one of the ways that they want to bring about this new world order is through massive population reduction. They want a massive reduction of population. Something like they want to, to bring the level of population down to 500 million people in the world. Well, there's like seven and a half billion people right now in the world. That's a whole lot of people that got to die. <laughs> you know, where are those people going to go and how, how, how are we going to get rid of them or, or whatever, you know? That brings up some really weird questions. But let's talk about the Bilderbergers because these are the people who are plotting this stuff. The Bilderberger Group is an annual private conference that is attended by some of the richest and most powerful people in the world to discuss important events in the world. These conferences are secret and confidential. You cannot get in. You, uh, if you tried to get in, you would, uh, who knows what would happen to you, but probably something bad. Attendees are sworn to secrecy about who discusses what, so no one is allowed to say anything that goes on or who said what, but they can discuss topics with other people. So they can say, well, we talked about this, well, we talked about that, but you can't say, this guy said this about this and stuff like that. You would get in serious trouble. Topics include globalization, European strategy, the Middle East, and U.S. elections. Wow, that's interesting. They're talking about U.S. elections. I thought that that's, you know, what the media has been nothing but screaming about the Russian involvement in U.S. elections, yet no one says anything about the Bilderbergers. The group was formed in 1954 with the goal of furthering relations between the United States and Western Europe. And this is what becomes very interesting. There's a long list of famous and influential people who have attended these meetings, okay? Bill and Hillary Clinton, George Bush Sr., Bill Gates, and of course, David Rockefeller has been there for like almost all of them. Not to mention countless senators, governors, heads of big corporations from our, not only our government, but also many other governments from around the world. What are all of these people who are in powerful positions doing getting together and having secret conferences and talking about? Like, why? Why do they need to do that? You know, that, that's one of the things that you've got to ask yourself. What, what, what are they talking about that they don't want us to know? Why is David Rockefeller praising the media for not shining the light on this, for not saying anything about it? That's some scary stuff, even though the media has been, inv has been invited to some of these meetings and stuff. Now, many people will say, Oh, okay, here's, here's an interesting fact. In 1991, Bill Clinton, who was the governor of Arkansas, met with the Bilderbergers. In 1992, he's elected president of the United States. And Bill Clinton, really, back in that time, I mean, he was a nobody. Like, who knew, who knew Bill Clinton before he was elected president? Really, nobody. But 1991, he's in the Bilderberger meeting. Next thing you know, he's becoming president of the United States. Notice George Bush Sr. also met with the Bilderbergers. Uh, I believe that's who he ran against, wasn't it? Wasn't it uh, Bush Sr. was trying to get reelected and then Bill Clinton ran against him and Clinton ended up winning? Well, both these guys are meeting with the Bilderbergers. Well, that's interesting. It sounds like they've got both guys in their pocket. And so, you know, it must be nice to have both candidates on your side. And so many people, people will say that there is a conspiracy with the Bilderbergers to bring forth a one world government while others... Uh, uh, just con continue to deny that there's any sort of conspiracy. But for there to be a conspiracy, it has to be kept secret, okay? That's one thing we have to realize. If there's going to be a, a conspiracy, by definition, it has to be kept secret. And world leaders have now been talking about the world order pretty openly. So what happened? Well, the Bible predicts that there will be a one world government, which will work with a one world religion, 
and a one-world financial system to control people. What do you think the mark of the beast is? It's a financial system. Who is the beast? You know, he's the, the antichrist. That's a government. And you've got the false prophet. That's a religion. All these things are going to come together according to the Bible, and it's all going to merge, and it's going to just pull the whole world together with it, and they'll love it. The people will love it. And, uh, and you think about that. You're like, you know, if you've ever read the Bible, you know that it, the Bible says if you take the mark of the beast, you're damned. Why would anybody want to have anything to do with a one world government then sort of thing? Well, first of all, biblical literacy in America is, has absolutely plummeted in the past 40, 50 years, whatever. And second of all, you've got to think about this. Um, 50 years ago, would anybody here, you know, some of us maybe were around 50 years ago. I wasn't. But 50 years ago, could you have ever convinced anybody to uh, if the government was, was saying, hey, I want you to keep this device on you. And what it does is it will tell us where you are every second of the day. Would anybody ever have agreed to that 50 years ago? Here, keep this up. No. But today, what do we do? We all have a device on our person all the time, which the government can and has. What do you think the NSA is? Tells them exactly where we are all the time. I mean, uh, according to some of the stuff that's come out, they can even tap into your phone to get it to record without you even knowing about it or doing anything. And they could be recording you while you're, while you're speaking and stuff like that. And so the point is, is that because of the convenience of these devices, we love it. We want it. And we're willing to give up our freedoms. Well, I think that's what the mark of the beast is going to be. It's going to be so convenient. No man can buy or sell without the mark. It's going to be so convenient, so awesome. We'll be like, yes, this is awesome. I totally want that. Not even realizing that the Bible says if you take the mark of the beast, you're damned. And so the Bible predicts, again, that there will be these things. And the scary thing is that people seem to love the globalism and hate God. Apparently, uh, and uh, one of the things that's interesting is, is Trump is apparently not a part of the plan for the globalists. I don't know what, what in the world is up with this. Well, when I did write these lessons, I wrote these lessons back in December. So it's been about nine months now. Uh, I'm still watching things. I still am not sure about Trump, about where he fits in this globalist, or if he's just a, a roadblock, or not a roadblock, a speed bump along the way. But even Trump is still buddy-buddy with people who go to the Bilderbergers. I don't think he's ever personally attended a Bilderberger meeting as far as I know. So point number two, the Trilateral Commission. So that is one group that is conspiring. Now let's shift over to another one. And the Trilateral Commission was also formed by David Rockefeller. That name keeps coming up. He is so involved with this stuff. It was back in 1973, and the point was to bring Western Europe, North America, and Japan into better cooperation. And what happened with David Rockefeller is he decided the Bilderbergers aren't getting enough done. We need to bring more of the world together, and so he formed the Trilateral Commission to try to get his interests going more over in Asia. Now, here's something that's very interesting. Many of the people who sit on the Trilateral Commission always seem to find their way to places of power appointed by U.S. presidents. Barack Obama appointed 11 members of the Trilateral Commission to top level and key positions in his, in his administration within his first 10 days in office. George Bush Sr. was a longtime member of the Trilateral Commission. Bill Clinton, longtime member of Trilateral Commission. Jimmy Carter, founding member of the Trilateral Commission. Dick Cheney was a member of the Trilateral Commission, and Bush Jr. had many members of the Trilateral Commission in his cabinet also. That's kind of interesting because I thought these guys were like, we got Republicans and we got Democrats, right? I thought these guys were like on two different sides and stuff because it really sounds like they're all on the same side, doesn't it? Doesn't it kind of sound like that? They're all pulling the exact same people from the exact same pool into, into all of their... In 1983 slash 84, I warned of a takeover of world governments being orchestrated by these people. There was an obvious plan to subvert true democracies and selected leaders were not being chosen based upon character, but upon their loyalty to an economic system run by the elites and dedicated to preserving their power. All we have now are pseudo democracies. This is Dr. Johannes B. Koppel, PhD, a former German defense minister official and advisor to former NATO Secretary General Manfred Wormer in, a, uh, inter in an interview and stuff. And, and uh, I've got, if you've got the um, PDF, I've got a reference here. You can uh, go and, and find some more information about that. And so this guy obviously knows what he's talking about. He's been in positions of power. He's saying, look, our leaders sold out. They sold out to the elites and they're all on the same side. They don't, you know, this, this whole issue of 
of uh, left and right and, and stuff like that. It's all a facade. It's all to keep you thinking that they that they're they're against each other, but they're but they're really uh, friends. Like um, any of you guys ever watch professional wrestling? If you have, that's fine. If you haven't, that's fine. One of the things about professional wrestling, I remember this uh, guy talking about it. He he used to love it, and he would see. I don't remember who it was, like Hulk Hogan, and uh, and who was another guy, like Ultimate Warrior, some other guy like that, or something. And, and and they would come and and they would fight in the ring, and they would smash each other's heads, and then they hated each other, right? And then this guy, he went, he would go, and he'd watch the the uh, watch the matches. And then he went back. He wanted to get an autograph of like Hulk Hogan, right? Because he was the good guy, I think, and like the other guy was the bad guy or something. And here he is. He's like looking backstage and backstage. Here are these guys, and they're they're holding each other by the hands, and they're talking to each other, and they're all buddy buddy. And he's like, wait a second, but they I, they hate each other. And he came to realize, oh, it's all fake, <laughs> you know? <laughs> the wrestling, it's all fake. The professional wrestling. Well, that's what's going on in our governments. It's all fake. They're all buddy buddy. Bill Clinton, Bush Jr., Barack Obama, all hanging out together to talk trash about Trump, right? What did it like? I can, okay, so Bill Clinton and Barack Obama—they're Democrats. But what's Bush Jr. doing? And why is he? And he's like super buddy buddy with Bill Clinton all of a sudden. Like I thought these guys are on total opposite spectrums of you know left and right and stuff. No, no, no. So is there any doubt that the entire world is being controlled by a global elite? anymore. Well, what does the Bible say? Again, the Bible says that the kings, they come together. The kings come together and they make counsel. Who are they making counsel against? Against the Lord. Against the Lord. The New World Order understands that America is the roadblock that is keeping them from their goal. They, and they realize that Christianity is the religion that is stopping them from their goal. Islam, Islam loves state religion and compelling people and stuff like that. They got no problem. They can roll those Islamic countries, no problem. You know, secular countries, no problem. They'll, they'll do whatever, man. If you can get people to accept uh, the, the sort of stuff that's, that the secular countries are accepting and say it's normal and stuff, you have no problem controlling those people. But Christians, they actually believe something. They actually have convictions. They're not going to go along with just anything that they want because they believe the Bible. And so it's the Christian countries that have to come down. Europe is slowly has pretty much fallen. America is the last, the last roadblock. And so some of the things that they're going to do and that they're already doing is, is uh, the, the New World Order elite are making good evil and evil good. And they're on a rampage to destroy the family because if they can destroy families, they can control people easier. That's a proven fact. And the media is helping. Uh, even the media, here's a couple of, uh, of topics from the media. It says, the Canadian family is in tradition. Blended families becoming the national norm. norm. Same-sex unions, the fastest group of married couples. Childless couples out, uh, outnumber families. And so basically the media is like super happy about all this stuff. They're just like praising the fact that, oh, we've got new families. We've got this, this sort of stuff. And really what it is is it's the new world order using the media to destroy morality and to demoralize people. Because again, wicked people are easier to control because why are wicked people easier to control? You think, oh man, wicked people, they're out, they're doing all of these sort of terrible things and, and they're committing crimes and stuff. No, that's not a problem. That's not a problem for the elites because it doesn't bother them that, you know, where you can riot in the streets all you want, that doesn't bother them. You know what bothers the elites? When somebody stands up and says, hey, what you have done is wrong. That's what bothers the elites. And that's the thing. If you've got a bunch of wicked people who are just going around doing whatever their own desires are, they're not watching the people in charge and making sure that they're not doing wicked things and that they're not uh, corrupting and stealing and, and doing whatever. And right now they are. Let me, let me encourage you, our government it is. And so Isaiah 59, 1 through 15, let's look through that really quickly. We probably won't read that whole section, but let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 59. And I'll just try to pick out a verse here. Let me prove my point to you. Let's start with verse two. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And so when a country gets to a certain point, like say murdered 60 million babies, there's a certain point where God's like, you know what, I'm done with you guys. You know, um, I like um, what uh, somebody said, I don't like the circumstances. With, we just recently had the um, shooting in Vegas. And Vegas and people were saying, hey, pray for Vegas, right? Pray for Vegas. And man, Vegas is Sin City. It flaunts Sin City. You know, they're, they're like, we love sin, we want sin, we want more of sin. Oh, but they don't want that sin. Okay. <laughs> they don't want the sin of, of murder, right? And so people were like, pray for Vegas, pray for the families. And you know what some people said? They're like, no, 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 don't pray for us. We're Vegas. Don't pray. For it's like, what? <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, it's crazy, right? 
Well, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And so what happens, what this chapter talks about, what happens is that people will become so wicked that when finally it comes to the time when something like this happens, like say there's a great shooting and a great um, uh, terrible thing that happens in Vegas and people are condemning it and stuff like that, which of course they condemn the guns. They don't condemn the man, they condemn the guns, but whatever. Um, the problem now is look at verse 14. It says, and judgment is turned away backwards and justice standeth afar off for truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. And what that's talking about is society becomes so corrupted that you can't even get justice. You can't even get justice. You go to the judge to say, man, this guy robbed and stole from me and, and did all these terrible things to me. And you go to the judge and the judge is taking bribes from the guy. And it's like, no, he's fine and lets him go. You know, I mean, that, that's, the, that's the degree of what, what we're coming to. We've got judges in this country that are just, they're, uh, they're terrible false, ju you know, they're not, they're not ruling true judgments. They're, they have an agenda that they're, that they're following instead. And this is what happened to ancient Israel. They became consumed with idols and with pleasure and eventually murder. Again, we didn't have time to read all 15 verses. But because everyone is so wicked, the few who look for justice receive none. No one can get justice because there's so much corruption. And the whole country was just such a mess that God had to just level it all. He's like, no, we just got to send in for Israel. The Assyrian captivity came first. Then for Judah, same thing happened. And the Babylonians came in, had to wipe them out, had to take them into captivity. And then 70 years later, they came back. They had to start all over. They had to start all over. And that's where America is going to get as, as we're, we're kind of continuing down that same spiral. So point number three, and I'll start making, uh, I'm going to have to start moving here. The Council on Foreign Relations. And so here's the point that I'm trying to make. So we've got the New World Order. We've got four lessons I've already taught that unfortunately I don't think anybody in this room has seen. So there's a lot of foundational work. I'm sorry that you're getting the very last lesson that there's a lot of foundational stuff that, I, that, that this would help out a lot if you knew, but we're gonna, let me try to summarize it really quickly. So the new world order is evil. They try to pretend like they're good, but they're really evil. They're gonna kill a whole bunch of people to take power and keep it. That's what they wanna do. And they've got all these different ways of doing it. The, the problems that we have going into society right now are orchestrated by this elite. They are intentionally doing this to tear apart the seams of society because they want to get society to the point where people are like, we can't get any justice. This country is awful. This is terrible. Tear it all apart. And they're going to receive whatever the global elite will give them, which they're saying, new world order, sparkly, awesome. You want this, right? Not realizing that it is pure evil. Then we've got the groups that are already planning it. So we've talked about the Bilderbergers. We've talked about the Trilateral Commission. They're all in the same group, Democrat, Republican, whatever. They're all together and they're all working together. How does Trump fit into this, President Trump? I don't know. Again, I, didn't, I haven't done any research. Uh, that's maybe something we should look up. How many people from the Trilateral Commission are on Trump's cabinet? How many people from the Council of Foreign Re uh, Relations, which is what we're going to talk about, are on Trump's cabinet? I don't know. I've not done that research. So let's just keep going. So point number three, the Council of Foreign Relations. This was formed in 1921 and known as a private party think tank to advise the government. And since its, since its inception, members of CFR have consistently been placed in top government positions. Presidents who were Council of Foreign Relations members, Herbert Hoover, Dwight D. Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, that one's disputed, Richard M. Nixon, Gerald R. Ford, James E. Carter, that's Jimmy Carter, George H.W. Bush, Bush Sr., William J. Clinton, Bill Clinton. I don't, again, I don't know about Barack Obama. I don't know about, I don't think he was. I don't, uh, uh, Bush Jr. wasn't. That's weird. I thought anybody could be president in this country, right? <laughs> right? Well, boy, it sure doesn't look like it. It looks like you've got to be on the CFR if you want in. Looks like you've got to be in the club, man, you know? So this is not to mention all the vice presidents, all the secretaries of state, all the secretaries of defense, the secretaries of treasurer, the CIA directors that have also been CFR, Council on Foreign Relations, members. It's an elite. It's an elite. You've got to be in the group. You've got to be in, the, in this elite. And the CFR has been running CFR member against CFR member for years under our current two-party political paradigm. That's what they've been doing. They've got Democrats that are CFR members and they've got Republicans that are CFR members. When Barack Obama won his reelection against Mitt Romney, a little known fact was the fact that Mitt Romney had an Obamacare policy too. 
he had the exact same thing with a slight little little turn on it that Obama was going to do when Obama put Obamacare in. Because, why? Because they're on the same team. They're, they're, the same, they're the same guys. Again, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter. So George Bush inserted many members, George Bush Jr. inserted many members of the CFR into his cabinet, as did President Obama, as did just about every president before them since the founding of the CFR. So in, in 1949, the UN Charter was drafted in San Francisco by a bunch of, you guessed it, CFR members, Council of Foreign Relations members, and the One World Agenda of the UN has been shaped by CFR from its founding. And uh, now do not forget that all, all of the major media outlets in the country are ran by members of the CFR. So again, what is this? It's, they're, they're, all, they're all in the same group. And that's right, the CFR has total control of the media from the very top. Don't think there is really a liberal media or a conservative media. Ultimately, they're all working together for the same goals. So are conspiracy theorists crazy? What do you think? Or is, there, or is there really an agenda out there to get you? Are you just sheeple that they just are just going to use and just throw you away? Man, as I think about that, it, it almost moves me to tears to think about it, how the people that we trust, you know, we, tr we trust the government. We trust these people that we want to trust, that we think they're there to help us. They don't care about us. But you know who does? Jesus. Jesus cares about me. He, he has my best interests in mind. He's not just using me. So, is there a just cause to fear a powerful elite that is out to shape the world? Well, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. With such a stranglehold on the U.S. government, is there really any wonder why things are so bad? Again, the social chaos that we see is totally engineered. The, the total breakdown in society, they've all planned it, and they've been pushing these agendas through government programs and whatnot and through the media, and they've got it all on lockdown through academia, through everything. They've been pushing this. And the Bible predicts that in the end, their plan will all come to ruin. It'll all fail. Look at Revelation chapter 16. Let's turn there because I think I've painted kind of a bleak picture and so the question really comes down today, are you a Christian? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your, as your Lord and Savior? Do you know him? Because if you don't, all you have is the new world order. It's coming. You're not going to stop it. I'm not going to stop it. No one's going to stop it. It's coming. Let's look at uh, 16, 16. So what happens to it when it does finally come? Revelation 16, 16 says, And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, it is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail for the plague thereof was exceeding great and so we can see that at the end God just grabs the whole world shakes it all it's like no you're done you're done and yet people still won't repent people who are caught up in this new world order in this beast system the powerful elites they're like no no and they blaspheme God and so it's obvious that the principles of the elites are not the principles of the Bible and will end in destruction. Look at Revelation 19:19. 19, 19. The Bible also predicts, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Who is the one who sat on the horse? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can see the whole world, the beast being the Antichrist, whatever beast system, the one world government with all the kings of the earth. Verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire with burning and brimstone. You're just like, poof, Jesus shows up, just grabs their leader, poof, gone, poof, false prophet, gone, just, just gets rid of them. No fight. There's no fight. There's no struggle. There's nothing. It's just gone. 
eject some, right? You guys are out of here. Get in the lake of fire. Verse 21. And this is the sad part. This is a really sad part. Verse 21. Because all these people are following the beast and they're following the false prophet. And we will have the new world order. We will have this great utopia. And Christ returns. And boom, there's their leaders. And what happens to all these people who were deceived by them? Verse 21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And so Jesus Christ is coming back. And when he comes back, he will crush the new world order. He will put down all of this foolishness and he will reign and rule for a thousand years on earth. And until that day, yeah, things are going to be bad. Society's going to, you know, what does it say? Day, today's are perilous times. Men will wax worse and worse. But if you're a Christian, if you love God, if you love Christ, you're on the winning side. And so that's what, you, that's what we need to realize about all this. All this talk about the new world order and all this stuff. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. People are intrigued by it. But it really comes down to, do you know Christ? The Bible is true. What it says in this book is true. And if you don't know Christ, if you, don't, if you aren't on his side, you're going to be in, that, in that, the, the losing side, if you will. You're going to be with a remnant that are slain. And so let's conclude. So we've only really truly scraped the surface, the very tip of the iceberg when it comes to the new world order. And again, the whole point of this, uh, this series, as I conclude this series, was not so much an expose on the new world order or to teach you more about the new world order, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to encourage you and, um, and strengthen your faith in the Bible, if you already are a Christian, or I wanted to encourage you to become a Christian and, uh, and you know, to follow Christ and to see that following after the world and the world's designs, it will all end in ruin and in, and in, uh, in uh, total destruction. And so we've only really scraped the surface of the New World Order. I mean, we have yet to discuss any other country and their involvement in any sort of detail. We did not discuss the EU and its role. You know, what effect the Brexit will ultimately play for the globalists. And we have not, like I said, we have not discussed President Trump and how his presidency, uh, whether he is uh, actually in it or whether he is, uh, you know, he's in cahoots or is he actually uh, a wild card that they didn't plan for. And, uh, and so we've also, we have not discussed any of the central bank issues and how they plan on controlling and already do control the money and the food of the world and all of this stuff. We haven't discussed any of that stuff. And so with this in mind, let us end our study with a handful of quotes from powerful leaders and key people from throughout the decades. Then you can ask yourself, is the new world order really a conspiracy theory anymore? And so here's a quote from Franklin D. Roosevelt. He said, the real truth of the matter is, as you and I know, that a financial element in the larger centers has owned the government ever since the days of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson, if you know anything about his history, he fought the central bank and won. And then a couple of years later, he, you know, he was out of power and, and the central bank ended up getting control. Uh, here's another one. The people will be crushed under the burden of taxes. Sound familiar? Loan after loan will be floated. Sound familiar? After having drained the present. Sound familiar? The state will devour the future. What's our national debt out now? Does anybody know? How many trillion? 21. 21? 21 trillion now? Yeah. Yeah. This was Frederick, uh, boy, I don't even know how to say this name, uh, Bastiat, Bastiat maybe. He's a French economist from the 1850s predicting the future of the global economy. Man, that guy nailed it. <laughs> He's right on mark. Uh, here's another one. We shall have the world government whether you like it or not. The only question is whether world government will be achieved by consent or by conquest. And right now it's looking more like consent. And that was uh, James Paul Warburg, the son of Paul Warburg, the author of the Federal Reserve Act in February 7th, 1950. Uh, here's another one. No one will enter the new world order unless he or she will make a pledge to worship Lucifer. No one will enter the new age unless he will take a Luciferian Initiation. Oh, yeah, I didn't even talk about that part. What is the actual religion? The religion of the New World Order is going to be Luciferianism. What is the religion of the Vatican? <laughs> we didn't even talk about that, right? Brother Nick was telling me about that um, earlier. And so, I, I, like I said, barely even scratch the surface. That was David Spangler said that the director of the UN Planetary Initiative. Yes, he was a director in the UN and one of the founding fathers of the New Age movement. If you know anything about the New Age movement, you know that it's pure evil and it, it, it is its Luciferian worship. Uh, okay, here's one from Mikhail Gorbachev. He said, we are moving toward a new world order, the world of communism. We shall never turn off that road. What is the new world order? It's this great thing. It's a utopia. That's what the communists said. 
and after they killed what 20 million of their own people and then 30 million of their own people and then however many millions of, of their own people President Richard Nixon said each of us has the hope to build a new world order. He said that in Hangzhou, China in February 1972. And here's one from somebody who was against this idea of the new world order. He said the drive of the Rockefellers and their allies is to create a one world government combining super capitalism and communism under the same tent, all under their control. Do I mean a conspiracy? Yes, I do. Am I convinced there is such a plot? International in scope, generations old in planning, incredibly evil in intent. Oh, I think I read that wrong. He said, I'm convinced that there is such a plot, international. And that was by Representative Larry P. McDonald, and he somehow or another ended up getting killed in the Korean Airlines flight 007. I wonder how that plane went down. I don't know if he, that was in 1983 when he died or if that's when the quote was, the quote's from 1983. And here's my last one. By the end of this decade, we will live under the first one world government that has ever existed in the society of nations. A government with absolute authority to decide the basic issues of survival. That's terrifying. One world government is inevitable. Who said that? None other than Carol Whitehola, also known as Pope John Paul II.